So today we have with us uh, Deborah Hobbs. So Deborah uh, works uh, in Bristol as a freelance ELT author and instructional designer, and also as an English language lecturer and teacher in adult and higher education. She has enjoyed over 10 years of English language teaching, examining and training, and regularly speaks at international teacher training events. Deborah has worked in several countries, including Italy, Spain, China, and Argentina. Deborah holds a deep tasel postgraduate certificate in online and distance education and is currently studying for an MA or the technology enhanced learning and design. Prior to becoming an educator, Deborah was a business change and project manager in financial services. So having said all of that, we're really looking forward to hearing from you, Deb. So I will hand over to you now. And maybe just that last uh, bit of information, uh, uh, please uh, use the Q&A box uh, that you will find at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask questions uh, that uh, Deborah, will, uh, Deborah will try and answer as many questions as possible at the end of a session. Uh, whereas you can use the chat box uh, to interact with Deborah during her presentation. Over to you, Deborah, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Please uh, put a note in the chat if you can't. So, uh, hi, hello, welcome. Uh, I'm uh, dialing in from almost sunny Bristol in the southwest of England. Hello from Argentina. Wow, I've, uh, I've been to Argentina, beautiful country. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so you should be able to. Yes, yes. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I don't, I can't see the chat here, so um, I'm relying on Paolo and Fabio to um, talk to me when. Uh, necessary so please do along. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, I became interested in intersectionality when I was uh, studying for my MA which started 18 months ago and so not very long really so I'm still learning myself and whilst I've always considered myself to be an inclusive teacher um, I was largely unaware of intersectionality and what that meant and of course why why would I I mean I'm privileged aren't I I'm white I'm British I'm well educated um, okay I've experienced sexism and I'm also a survivor of abuse but nevertheless I'm privileged but ignorance isn't an excuse is it? and once I started to reflect on intersectionality and what it means I realised that I had to challenge some of my own unconscious biases to be an inclusive teacher. And I hope to raise some awareness today of intersectionality for anyone who's not sure what it means and with you consider how this impacts education and provide you with some teaching ideas. Um, I've got some resources as well to share with you uh, toward the end, but as I said, I am still learning. So if you have any thoughts or ideas that you want to share as we progress or at the end, my LinkedIn uh, um, details are here on the slide. Please do feel free to contact me. Okay, so we know that huge steps have been taken recently in terms of um, inclusivity in education, particularly around learning difficulties, um, things like ADHD etc and according to UNESCO we can see here that inclusive education aims to guarantee education for all learners and their unique requirements which of course extends beyond and um, whilst including but extends beyond uh, some of the disabilities that we may already focus on. And intersectionality is a term uh, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, an American academic in the late 1980s, and it describes how race, class, gender, and other personal characteristics, so for example, age and refugee status, intersect with one another and overlap. So Kimberly wanted to remind us that when thinking about equality, we must recognize that humans often have more than one characteristic, uh, which 
a b subject to discrimination or hostility if we're fully to understand and identify um with others and um, with ourselves for that matter we need to accept that all of our parts the things that make us who we are are interconnected so that means for example, a Muslim British female teacher aged 56 with two children who was widowed at 21. She is simultaneously a Muslim British, a female, a teacher aged 56, a mother and a widower. And all of these identities are interconnected. So I think when we, or when I focused solely on one group membership, in my classroom. So, for example, I grouped together children with a specific uh, educational difference, like dyslexia, or I grouped together students from one nationality in an exam class. Then, without realizing it and without meaning to, I was still excluding students. And Edvina's intersection onion here, um, I think, really clearly shows how. All So we might say that intersectionality is experienced by individuals who identify as members of historically oppressed groups and from an inclusive teaching perspective um, we broaden this um, so let's look at income for example and here i might not necessarily only mean um, students from low-income families but I've also experienced examples of very wealthy students feeling embarrassed or excluded um, by their peers in class because of their wealth. And language as well, for example, we have fast, fast finishers in class, don't we often, that are students who always finish first, they, they get the highest scores, um, they complete the grammar exercises before anybody else does. And in actual fact, they may also feel excluded um, because they're not part of, uh, they can't identify perhaps with some of the other students. So what does that look like for our students? Here we can see uh, two students in our class, um, Paolo and Amina. And we can see how the intersection of their personal identity overlap. So although both Paolo and Mina have the same learning difference, in this case dyslexia, and of course we should provide them with the learning materials that they need in order to thrive in this area, they have other intersections, their other parts of their identity. Another example, a, a, a white teenage girl may, you know, may face gender discrimination because she's not a white teenage boy. But if we consider a, a teenage lesbian of colour who uses a wheelchair, um, she will face gender, racial and sexual discrimination and ableism. So looking at um, a couple of examples, uh, material examples that I found today when I was uh, continuing with my research, um, I'd like to ask you, um, thinking back to Paolo and, and, and Mina, their identities, um, they're separate but at the same time different identities. Which of Paolo and Mina's identities might these materials include? Or and how could we make these materials more inclusive? Because we, we need them to identify and engage. So I'm just going to give you a, a minute or so, or so to um, look at the materials and think about this question or these questions. And if you could pop 
ideas into the chat. Uh, Fabio, maybe, to uh, reach out to me sure and that get I'm, some. I'm here. I, I, I can... Uh... I can let you know as soon as anything pops up in the chat box, I will let you know, yeah. Okay, so which of Paula and Mina's identities might these mirrored materials include or exclude? So one that I see, for example, um, Paolo may identify with um, the uh, material on the right from Ben Taylor because um, it talks about, Ben talks about his parents splitting up and Paolo is um, his parents of divorce. So that he may feel included uh, when he when he reads that part of the, of the text. That's an example of how Paolo come with parents who are divorced, that part of his identity may connect but with the material. Um, yeah, Deb, we got a question from uh, uh, Laura in the chat box. She says, uh, what does Paolo identify as? And uh, Silvana uh, says, uh, uh, choosing texts about normal people. And uh, Laura says, straight, asks straight. So these are the comments that we got so far. But let's go back then, if I... So here they are. So, Deborah, could you talk closer to the microphone because some people are having problems? Absolutely. Is that better? Thank you. Okay. So, Thank we can you. see here that um, Paolo is uh, dyslexic. I, he identi Paolo identifies as he. Um, he, uh, so he identifies as male, he. Um, so, he is heterosexual. Um, he is a white youth with parents. Uh, he, eligible for free school meals due to his family having an income below the poverty line. Mina is dyslexic, so she has obviously a religious identity um, and heritage impacting her identities, impacting but part of her identity, sorry. Um, she identifies as gay. Now I've said she, uh, I think, I have said he for Paolo. Let's, um, Say that um, Mina identifies as gay, but she, the personal pronoun is she. Okay. Um, she also is of refugee status. Okay, does that answer the question? I think it does. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Rafaela uh, wrote maybe references to wedding ceremonies, same sex marriages, people from different origins apart from white Europeans. Yeah, that's great. I'll just put that back so we can see on the left then the uh, material on the left are uh, very quite traditional in the sense of um, bride and groom um, so that may uh, Mina may feel excluded from that um, so perhaps introducing same -sex marriages would um, include Mina's identity more. I, I also thought with the, the photograph on the left it appears to be quite a wealthy wedding and of course um, Paolo um, he doesn't come from a wealthy background he gets free school meals and actually to see that wealth um, he may feel quite excluded um, by the um, image on the right as well the material on the right again um, it's very um, mother father which may um, exclude Mina. Okay. And as was mentioned, it's very Euro, uh, Euro-centric. Yeah, Deb, referring back to uh, what, what's coming up from the chat box, uh, uh, we got um, Silvana that comments, sorry, normal does not mean anything. And, and Anna Rita says, uh, um, answering your question, marriage, uh, religious ceremony might make Nina feel excluded. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, I agree completely. You know, what is normal? I mean, what is normal? I mean, it, it's wrong, isn't it, to label as normal? 
um, I think sometimes I, I, I do this, I forget. And, and so, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm still um, considering my own unconscious bias and I'm trying um, to be more aware with the language that I use and the things that I say because it's quite important. Okay, so let's move on then to the um, impact on um, education. For students from less privileged backgrounds, students of colour, transgender and non-binary students amongst others have not always been made to feel welcome by their peers, um, which obviously affects mental and emotional well-being, it reduces confidence and as a result this is going to affect their ability to study and of course ability to achieve success. And um, when I was studying this it really did force me to think about the part that I was playing in experience of my students and how my own privileges were intersecting with others and I had to really think about my biases. So unconscious teachers bias, um, we all have biases don't we and our brains are wired to generalise and make judgments and, and that's like really healthy in, in decision making um, generally sometimes um, but a growing num number of studies show that unconscious teacher bias actually impacts and you know we care about our teachers, I, uh, students, I care about my students and accepting that my unconscious bias might impact their success was something I really found uncomfortable. For me, it was the elephant, elephant in the room. So um, I wanted to ask myself these questions because when I started to reflect, um, I could think of examples when, um, as a teacher, I may have had unconscious bias, but also when I received it. So I'll just give you an example. You can see that I have red hair and at school, because of my red hair, I had a teacher who on my first day told me I had a fiery temper. And I didn't have a fiery temper, but that was the lens that he looked through when he looked at me. So gradually and only in his class, um, I developed a fiery temper. It was like a self filling uh, prophecy and when I moved to the next year um, this teacher told another teacher out there with the red hair she's got fiery temper and and that really um, you know impacted me and from a teaching perspective I remember an incident where I had a Thai student excellent behavior excellent motivation she was like my ideal student, I, well, I, we all have them, don't we? And she always did her homework, she contributed in class, and on the day that she um, passed her first she disrespected her, um, she disrespected her classmates, she disrespected her parents, and she'd been sent to the UK um, as a last resort um, and I asked myself had I known before she joined my class whether um, you know that she had misbehaved and that she had been a poor student would I have lowered my expectations of her would I have treated her differently in class and I couldn't answer no I couldn't answer no I would have. And so I asked myself these questions, you know, was I selecting more girls than boys, or more boys than girls? Um, and I was selecting 
and girls because girls never got selected when I was at school and I was trying to readdress the balance. In doing so, I was excluding boys, even though I was trying to include the girl. And I questioned if I was harder on assessing people who perhaps were noisy or was I giving higher marks you handed in writing with a meter handwriting so by un uh, unconsciously grading them depending on how neat their handwriting was as opposed to the level of English and I think that I had to take part uh, sorry take responsibility for my part Experience. There's a really um, good resource actually called Leader in Me Schools, um, and that gives a lot more information and detail about bias. It's Leader in Me Schools, I would highly recommend. Sorry, Deborah, can you please check your microphone because um, we cannot hear you very well. Okay, I've turned it up. Is that better? It, it, it's especially when you move that we can okay. hear you very well. I'll stay still. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. I do tend to throw my arms around. <laughs> is, that, uh, is that better? I think so, yes. Okay. Thank you. So looking through, looking through, I'm going to say Rose Phil, looking through an intersectional lens requires daily commitment. And, um, you know, here are some uncomfortable questions that we can ask ourselves. And I'll, I'll give you a moment to consider those. Um, if you have experienced unconscious bias or if you have accidentally, um, you know, like myself with my students, um, if you have had unconscious bias now that you're looking at these questions and you would like to share that in the chat, please do. But I realize that might be, you might feel uncomfortable doing that. So I um, don't want to put anything in that. Great. But here are some questions that I just want you to ask yourself uh, for a moment before we move. Okay, Fabio, is there anything in chat that you want to mention? Yes, I'm just uh, looking now. So uh, we've got, uh, um, right, so um, um, Rafaela says, as humans, I guess we all do, but the challenge is to overcome them. Uh, Alicia says, I try to change different activities, games, songs, and a lot of different activities. Um, and Laura says, I think I hold many biases. And Nadia says, I must confess, not every day, sometimes I slip. Thank you. Can you hear me better now, Fabio? I think mainly, yes. The drum okay. movements were, it, it cracks a little bit. Okay, okay. All right, so, yeah, um, thank you very much for sharing. Um, for sharing those. Let's move on. So, if we think about now adding an intersectional lens um, to our classroom teaching, um, something we might do, because an intersectional um, educational lens takes various social, historical and political uh, 
processes into consideration in order to better understand how to support a wide range of experiences and diverse students. So to purposefully include um, transgender and gender non-conforming students and students from other minorities in our classrooms um, can only be a good thing. And we may teach EFL students identity language so that they are better able or um, they are better able to communicate their identity and help others to communicate theirs. We may avoid offensive terms like tranny and disorder and instead use positive terms like transgender or non-binary. Where possible, we might use the singular pronoun they rather than he or she or invite students to discuss which personal pronoun they want to be identified by. Um, for example, he, she, he, um, etc. And when using flashcards, um, you know, try to avoid and uh, include a mix of people, cisgender, transgender, men and women, and where possible include non-conforming, uh, non-gender conforming people as examples. So, as we mentioned earlier, consider LGBTQ when teaching vocabulary for exam English topics like family sports. So the person I most admire is my sister's wife, um, that type of thing, inclusive, um, inclusive vocabulary. So here we're looking at um, inclusive vocabulary, so choice of names, gender neutral names like Sky and Ash, uh, names from a diverse range of cultures, so not UK or Centric, Nina, Abea, Sala, encourage students to use a diverse range of names when they create characters in their written work, uh, when they role play, and include foods from minority cultures, tofu, chicken feet, um, halal food, uh, clothes, hijab, the Chinese hanfu, the Japanese komodo, and the same for jobs, you know, an ear cleaner, a shark tagger. Um, I only recently discovered that a shark tagger was quite obviously somebody who tagged a shark. Um, so, as we said, avoid being um, too UK or EU centric. Here on the right, you can see a resource from um, the Open World series, which is the inclusive, from the inclusive workbook. I'll, I'll more of that later. More ideas then are um, student created posters to explain how social identity affects opportunities. A class tolerance charter. So we think, uh, I typically, in, when I have a new class, I encourage them to come up with a class rules. You know, we will not um, use English, uh, sorry, we will only use English in class we will not use our mobile phones, etc. But a class tolerance charter um, enables you to focus specifically on um, tolerance and acceptance and understanding. So we will think about how our behaviour impacts others. We will take responsibility for the things that we say and the things that we do. Student created videos, uh, for example, the forms of privilege, and I um, graded work anonymously. It is a little more complicated because I asked the students to write their name on the back of their written work. So I couldn't see who it was um, when I graded it. And I found that quite an interesting um, exercise. Okay, so next we have um, In My Shoes and a Personal Identity Wheel. This is a, a lovely example. The, the worksheet is on the right hand side and it's really lovely because it, it, it um, looks at 
um, the different institutional identities and ask questions about um, how you perceive yourself and how you think others perceive you. Um, you can also ask uh, students to um, come up with, so in your shoes is when they then create an identity for somebody else, again using the um, personal identity wheel, but they can um, present themselves as somebody else and maybe write a short diary entry or something about their day as that person. You can introduce for exams things like second and third conditional here to talk about um, he hadn't said this or if I hadn't done that, um, this wouldn't have happened, that type of thing. Um, and so it's a really nice way to use the language for the exam, but also uh, be more diverse. My fullest name is lovely. That's where students write their full name on a piece of paper and then discuss it. And you can give them questions, for example, who gave you that name? Um, why did they choose that name? How, do you know the ethnic origin of your name? Um, do you have any nicknames? Um, how did you get them? What is your preferred name? Would you like to change your name? The uh, next one is uh, the power and discrimination uh, phrases. And that's uh, that's really interesting because that looks at um, the way a lot of phrases start masculine feminine. So we would give, I would give the students these uh, pairs, king and queen, boy and girl, etc. And ask them to think about what they, how they feel and what they can imagine, what they see as they hear these names. And then I ask them to reverse the names. So queen and king, girl and boy, wife and husband and ask them then to see to notice what changes in terms of their perception of the phrases. So obviously we're aiming here to add an intersectional lens to inclusive education. Um, we're not replacing the good work that's already uh, going on. Um, and uh, here are a couple of examples of inclusivity. This one taken from Open World uh, Inclusive Workbook uh, Level Preliminary. I can never say that. Preliminary. <laughs> and here we've got uh, the grammar. I'm, in, <laughs> I'm getting tongue-tied. The grammar animations. Uh, color coded, um, no personal pronoun. We, I use we a lot because it's inclusive. However, a teacher recently said to me um, that when she hears we, it she feels excluded um, because it makes her feel like us, them. So, thinking about that, being aware of that, maybe avoiding we. Um, so, um, present simple is used rather than we use it about habits. That uh, might be something for you to consider. Uh, this is from the um, same workbook, um, and you can see here really nice use of colour coding. Um, colour coding obviously not only helps learners who have certain visual impairments, it can also be used to support Arabic students who might experience vowel blindness. And this is the idea that Arabic speakers deal with the complexity of, of written English by ignoring the vowel sounds. Um, and they focus on the consonants. So, in a class, for example, um, I had a student who saw the word, uh, the word girl, G-I-R-L, and read it as gorilla because he focused, he could see the consonant sounds, G-R-L, and put the gaps, the vowels that he thought might fit. So it, it vowel blindness. And there's the example just at the bottom there. 
so that's that's a quite a useful um, strategy teaching our victims. We mentioned fast finishers at the uh, earlier on uh, when we were talking about the intersectionality in a broader sense, and this is an example from the Open World First Inclusive Workbook where um, there's a push yourself section that can support those uh, learners who perhaps finish, uh, generally finish before others. So if we think about, I know this is uh, on topic at the moment for many of you, and if we think about the sustainable development goals, um, being more inclusive and adding an intersectional lens to our teaching, I think, support many of these uh, goals. Uh, so, well, I'll ask the question: Which of these, um, if we if we add an intersectional lens to inclusive education, which of these sustainable development goals do you think would be better supported and why? So if we add an intersectional lens to inclusive education, which of these sustainable development goals would be better supported and why? Fabio, when you're ready to uh, read anything in the chat. So here I am, here I am, Deb. I was just uh, uh, looking at what comes up. So we, we got the first uh, uh, first one from Daniela. She says, number four, there is a, so a quality education. So, so far, this is the, uh, and then we got, yeah, quality education again from Joanna. Um, we got from Elena says uh, gender equality, well being, and quality education. Whereas Cinzia and Katerina both agree on gender equality. Uh, and again, uh, number three and four for Maria Chiara, which are good health and quality education. Joanna says climate action. Rafaela says five and eight. Uh, they're, they're really flowing quite quickly. <laughs> it's hard to keep tra track of, of them all. But yeah, we got also reduced inequalities, zero hunger from Donatella. And then, uh, yeah, so mainly these ones, I would say. So we've got three, four, five, ten, eight. Yeah, I hope I'm not missing out on any, but okay. quite a few. Quite a Thank few, you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I had uh, three, four, uh, five. 10 and I also had 16 actually as well as 8 and 9 so 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10 and 16 because I was thinking at you know peace, justice, strong institution I was just thinking about equality um, from a judicial sense so I, I'm definitely three is a good one isn't it good health and well-being because we talk about um, you know mental health there's an interesting, an interesting distinction, distinction made by Rafael, and she says uh, it could be one, two, four, and ten for students coming from developing countries, whereas it may be three, four, seven, eight, and ten for students who live in developed countries. So she makes that distinction, which yeah, and I, yeah, yeah, great, that's a, a really, a really good observation. Um, but I think we can see that, you know, I, when I first looked at this and I thought uh, only four, but when I actually took a step back, I, I realised that there was a lot more, a lot more to it than that. OK, so we're almost done. Um, I just now have some resources to share with you. So um, these are some really um, good uh, diversity, uh, intersectional um, uh, resources that I discovered in when I was preparing for this presentation today. So diversity toolkit, uh, really useful for teach for teachers with lesson ideas. Lots of really good discussion questions, 
So my fullest name, that activity came from there. Uh, there's a link called Writing for Change, which is part of Learning for Justice, and there are seven. There's a 73-page PDF, which includes the him, her, brother, sister question order activity. Um, so many um, examples in there of, of, of materials that you can use. Learning for Justice. Uh, this has hundreds of ESL lesson and learning plans created by teachers. Topics include exam topics like uh, the internet, consumer rights, advertising, social justice, um, really nice responsive reflection hands out for students to complete. Uh, principal posters, there's one on the right, um, so that's really, really good. The University of Michigan, third one down. Um, Inclusive teaching, that's where I found the personal identity wheel, so that's got some great stuff in there. Obviously, the Open World uh, Inclusive Workbook series um, goes without saying. The final one is Super DeVille. Uh, Super DeVille, that includes videos acted by children and it explores social and emotional learning, so things like dyslexia, um, and it helps develop self-esteem, resilience and empathy and that's particularly aimed at children between 7 to 12 and not only those with learning differences. So there's a video on there for example called Professor Boom and the Dyslexic Brain and there's um, the, the actor is a mad scientist and um, exploring the differences between the dyslexic and the non-dyslexic brain so really really um, excellent i would be really interested to know if you have used any of these uh, resources if you have please put comments in the chat um, i've dipped into them um, but there's so much in there it's feedback from you would be great okay so um that's another uh that's just the image credits and the references. Uh, another poster um, from Teaching Tolerance. Um, they're, they're just great. Uh, I love them. So, yeah, thank you very much. And I hope you could hear me better as we went on. And if you have any questions, I think we have some time. Yes, certainly. That. Uh, yeah, we, we could definitely hear you better um, after the first few minutes. So that was uh great and uh, there is uh, quite a lot of positive comments uh, um and uh, and i think a few questions as well um so let me just uh, uh pick one for you well um chiara shared with us and this is rather than uh, uh questions are comments but share them uh, um, around her uh, midway through your presentation she said uh, i think that every context may make someone feel excluded Possibly it is the repetition of some patterns over and over again that can make someone feel an outsider. I would define myself as binary as for now, and a continuous exposition to non-binary contexts would probably make me feel uncomfortable and vice versa for other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that's a really valid point. And I guess what we don't want to do is and exclude people, you know, who I don't don't include heterosexuals, for example, you know, so I think we need to include by adding and not by, you know, we don't necessarily need to change, we need to add and add. So it's it's absolutely okay to, to use a source with a traditional, I'm going to call it for the moment, and I apologise if that's wrong terminology, but uh, a bride and a groom, it's absolutely okay to use that. Um, but we also need to introduce something that balances that and or that isn't that includes a, a, a everybody because it's about including everybody when we can and how we can so um uh, while uh, i uh, look for the next question um i think that um sure who, can we yeah antonio was asking whether we could uh, just go back to the previous slide the one with the links so that while we do the Q and A, they can uh, kind of check the links again. I think it was uh, even the, yeah before this one. Yeah, yeah, the resources. 
Uh, right, there's a, a, a doubt that Chinzi shared with us, and she says, is it right to teach the singular they in middle school? Could it be confusing? Not 100% sure what she referred to, I may have- Yeah, missed. well, when I was, no, well, now I, 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 I don't want to stick my neck on the line, but I was taught that they was the correct uh, personal pronoun to use. Um, but things change, don't they? Grammar changes, English changes. Um, so, but I would use they on a personal level. I do use they without thinking about it. So I might say, or if I was talking about you, Fabio, for example, I might say they had. Um, so, so I would suggest that they is okay. Um, but I'm sure there are others who can challenge and challenge that. Yeah, um, I think it's it's quite. I mean, uh, it, it was really you know uh, great. There was so much to take uh, take in. Uh, so many of the things you presented uh, are things that not necessarily often are you know spoken of uh, openly. And um, in fact, Laura's question or comment, uh, I think, is actually quite um, relevant to, to many uh, people in the audience, possibly. He says, we sometimes have to cope with family biases, so gender non-conformity is still a taboo topic, especially mm -hmm. if you teach me the school. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I suppose the question there would be, how do you make sure that uh, you do the right thing mm -hmm. while at the same time uh, yeah. kind of, uh, not creating conflict with, uh, you know, with the families of your yeah, and I have two, I think, examples of this. One is when I marked uh, um, a Muslim student essay, and the essay topic was about family and the role of um, mothers in the family. And when I marked his uh, paper, um, his opinion was very different from mine. Um, and what I discovered I was doing initially is I was looking for I was looking for errors in his English language and I was looking for errors in the way that he structured his essay and supported his argument because I didn't agree with his opinion. And I was then aware that I was actually conscious of bias and that task, it was well written, it was supported with um, uh, it was well supported it, and his opinion was very different to mine and I needed to be really careful that I didn't mark him down because I didn't agree with his opinion. The same token, um, I've had class at, this, at the same time I've had classes where we have, um, we watched a video about um, homophobic bullying in school and I um, I had uh, two or three Muslim students in the class and I wanted to show this video. I thought it was a beautiful video and I wanted to um, a multicultural uh, class. So before break, uh, I said to the class, this is what we're going to do. Please come and talk to me privately during the break if you're uncomfortable. And um, one of the uh, Muslim students came to me and said, you know, this isn't, I, I don't, you know, this doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. However, I accept that this is the topic and I'm happy to discuss it afterwards. And, and, and nobody, so I checked first that it was, you know, an acceptable topic for all. Um, whilst I think the important thing, thing for me is that students um, respect one another's views and opinions and beliefs and um are accepting um and that's i'm, I'm not I, I can't change someone's opinion and who's and who's to say i should um so it's about tolerant tolerance accepting understanding those are the things that i think that i i prefer i have to focus on right thanks a lot Deborah. i think we just have time for one last question and uh I would take uh, uh, Laura's one, and uh, she says, how can I ask what pronoun learners identify with when they don't know their meaning? How can I use non-stereotype non -stereotype, stereotyped 
stereotypical uh, images of people uh, who identify as uh, cis women and men and trans women and men? Okay, so I get, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but I guess you could, I mean, if we had flashcards with, um, uh, you know, uh, transgender, uh, non-binary, uh, female, male, um, you know, someone that looks very feminine, someone that, 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 that's very masculine, someone that, that doesn't looks neither feminine nor masculine, for example, um, we can teach the different pronouns. And I think then we can then have a conversation, can't we? You know, so my name is Deborah, um, my personal pronoun is uh, she, or she, or, or they, or, you know, and I, I, I actually, when I was studying, there was um, a student who wanted to be called, it wanted her, um, wanted its personal pronoun to be it. And, um, you know, I had to, I had to respect that. So I think it's, 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 you know, we need to teach the vocabulary and we need to teach the meaning and then we can give the students the opportunity to choose. Thanks a lot for, for this, Deb. I think uh, we've uh, we've run out of time now. Um, there, there were, I think, more questions, uh, and uh, and it's certainly uh, in a, quite a few things that we could, uh, I suppose, keep discussing. But it's just great to start the discussion, and uh, really hope that uh, you know this uh, session inspired you to think about uh, um, you know many of the topics that Deb has presented. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, it was great to have you with us um, and uh, yeah, as anticipated at the beginning of the session, uh, um, within a, a few days, uh, uh, probably by next week, uh, we'll have uh, uh, these sessions recording available on uh, our uh, blog, so Better Learning blog. Um, you will receive an, uh, a follow-up email with uh, indications on how to access the blog in the recordings as well as the certificate of, certificate of attendance. And if you need a SOFIA certificate, then you need to make sure that uh, uh, you first register on the SOFIA platform. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks everyone. very much. Yeah. Please track me down on LinkedIn if you want to continue this conversation. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.